Twixt Land and Sea by Joseph Conrad, Part 4 out of 5. Chapter Roman 4. I suppose praiseworthy motives are a sufficient justification almost for anything. What could be more commendable in the abstract than a girl's determination that poor Papa should not be worried? and her anxiety that the man of her choice should be kept by any means from every occasion of doing something rash, something which might endanger the whole scheme of their happiness. Nothing could be more tender and more prudent. We must also remember the girl's self-reliant temperament, and the general unwillingness of women, I mean women of sense, to make a fuss over matters of that sort. As has been said already, Heemskirk turned up some time after Jasper's arrival at Nelson's Cove. The sight of the brig lying right under the bungalow was very offensive to him. He did not fly ashore before his anchor touched the ground as Jasper used to do. On the contrary, he hung about his quarter-deck mumbling to himself, and when he ordered his boat to be manned, it was in an angry voice. Freya's existence, which lifted Jasper out of himself into a blissful elation, was for Heemskirk a cause of secret torment, of hours of exasperated brooding. While passing the brig he hailed her harshly and asked if the master was on board. Schultz, smart and neat in a spotless white suit, leaned over the taffrail, finding the question somewhat amusing. He looked humorously down into Heemskirk's boat, and answered, in the most amiable modulations of his beautiful voice, Captain Allen is up at the house. Sir, but his expression changed suddenly at the savage growl. What the devil are you grinning at? Which acknowledged that information. He watched Heemskirk land, and, instead of going to the house, stride away by another path into the grounds. The desire tormented Dutchman found old Nelson or Nielsen at his drying sheds very busy superintending the manipulation of his tobacco crop, which, though small, was of excellent quality, and enjoying himself thoroughly. But Heemskirk soon put a stop to this simple happiness. He sat down by the old chap, reduced him before long to a state of concealed and perspiring nervousness, it was a horrid talk of authorities, and old Nelson tried to defend himself. If he dealt with English traders, it was because he had to dispose of his produce somehow. He was as conciliatory as he knew how to be, and this very thing seemed to excite Heemskirk, who had worked himself up into a heavily breathing state of passion. And the worst of them all is that, Alan, he growled. Your particular friend, A, eh, you have let in a lot of these Englishmen into this part. You ought never to have been allowed to settle here. Never. What's he doing here now? Old Nelson or Nielsen, becoming very agitated, declared that Jasper Allen was no particular friend of his. No friend at all at all. He had bought three tons of rice from him to feed his workpeople on. What sort of evidence of friendship was that? Heemskirk burst out at last with the thought that had been gnawing at his vitals.
Yes, sell three tons of rice and flirt three days with that girl of yours. I am speaking to you as a friend, Nielsen. This won't do. You are only on sufferance here. Old Nelson was taken aback at first, but recovered pretty quickly. Won't do, certainly, of course. It wouldn't do, the last man in the world. But his girl didn't care for the fellow, and was too sensible to fall in love with anyone. He was very earnest in impressing on Heemskirk his own feeling of absolute security. And the lieutenant, casting doubting glances sideways, was yet willing to believe him. Much you know about it, he grunted nevertheless. But I do know, insisted old Nelson, with the greater desperation because he wanted to resist the doubts arising in his own mind. My own daughter, in my own house, and I not to know come, it would be a good joke, lieutenant. They seem to be carrying on considerably, remarked Heemskirk moodily. I suppose they are together now, he added, feeling a pang which changed what he meant for a mocking smile into a strange grimace. A harassed Nelson shook his hand at him. He was at bottom shocked at this insistence, and was even beginning to feel annoyed at the absurdity of it. Pooh, pooh, I will tell you what, Lieutenant, you go to the house, and have a drop of gin and bitters before dinner. Ask for Freya. I must see the last of this tobacco put away for the night, but I will be along presently. Heemskirk was not insensible to this suggestion. It answered to his secret longing, which was not a longing for drink. However, old Nelson shouted solicitously after his broad back a recommendation to make himself comfortable. And that there was a box of cheroots on the veranda. It was the west veranda that old Nelson meant, the one which was the living room of the house, and had split rattan screens of the very finest quality. The east veranda sacred to his own privacy, puffing out of cheeks, and other signs of perplexed thinking, was fitted with stout blinds of sailcloth. It was more like a long balcony. It did not communicate with the other two, and could only be approached by a passage inside the house. Thus it had a privacy which made it a convenient place for a maiden's meditations without words, and also for the discourses, apparently without sense, which, passing between a young man and a maid, become pregnant with a diversity of transcendental meanings. This north veranda was embowered with climbing plants. Freya, whose room opened out on it, had furnished it as a sort of boudoir for herself, with a few cane chairs and a sofa of the same kind. On this sofa she and Jasper sat as close together as is possible in this imperfect world where neither can a body be in two places at once nor yet two bodies can be in one place at the same time. They had been sitting together all the afternoon, and I won't say that their talk had been without sense. Loving him with a little judicious anxiety lest, in his elation, he should break his heart over some mishap. Freya naturally would talk to him soberly. He, nervous and brusque when away from her, appeared always as if overcome by her visibility. By the great wonder of being palpably loved, an old man's child, having lost his mother early, thrown out to sea out of the way while very young. He had not much experience of tenderness of any kind. In this private, 
foliage embowered veranda, and at this late hour of the afternoon, he bent down a little, and, possessing himself of Freya's hands, was kissing them one after another, while she smiled and looked down at his head with the eyes of approving compassion. At that same moment Heemsker was approaching the house from the north. Antonia was on the watch on that side, but she did not keep a very good watch. The sun was setting. She knew that her young mistress and the captain of the Benito were about to separate. She was walking to and fro in the dusky grove with a flower in her hair and singing softly to herself. When suddenly, within a foot of her, the lieutenant appeared from behind a tree. She bounded aside like a startled fawn, but he skirk with a lucid comprehension of what she was there for, pounced upon her, and catching her arm, clapped his other thick hand over her mouth. If you try to make a noise, I will twist your neck. This ferocious figure of speech terrified the girl sufficiently. Heemskirk had seen plainly enough on the veranda Freya's golden head, with another head very close to it. He dragged the unresisting maid with him by a circuitous way into the compound, where he dismissed her with a vicious push in the direction of the cluster of bamboo huts for the servants. She was very much like the faithful camerista of Italian comedy, but in her terror she bolted away without a sound from that thick, short, black-eyed man with a cruel grip of fingers like a vice. Quaking all over at a distance, extremely scared and half-inclined to laugh, she saw him enter the house at the back. The interior of the bungalow was divided by two passages crossing each other in the middle. At that point he skirk, by turning his head slightly to the left as he passed, secured the evidence of carrying on so irreconcilable with old Nelson's assurances that it made him stagger. With a rush of blood to his head, two white figures, distinct against the light, stood in an unmistakable attitude. Freya's arms were round Jasper's neck. Their faces were characteristically superimposed on each other, and Heemskirk went on. His throat choked with a sudden rising of curses, till on the west veranda he stumbled blindly against a chair and then dropped into another as though his legs had been swept from under him. He had indulged too long in the habit of appropriating Freya to himself in his thoughts. Is that how you entertain your visitors, you? He thought, so outraged, that he could not find a sufficiently degrading epithet. Freya struggled a little and threw her head back. Somebody has come in, she whispered. Jasper, holding her clasped closely to his breast and looking down into her face, suggested casually. Your father. Freya tried to disengage herself but she had not the heart absolutely to push him away with her hands. I believe it's Heemskirk. She breathed out at him. He, plunging into her eyes in a quiet rapture, was provoked to a vague smile by the sound of the name. The ass is always knocking down my beacons outside the river, he murmured. He attached no other meaning to Heemskirk's existence, but Freya was asking herself whether the lieutenant had seen them. Let me go, kid, she ordered in a peremptory whisper. Jasper obeyed, and stepping back at once, continued his contemplation of her face under another angle. I must go and see, she said to herself anxiously. 
Don't stay late this evening, was her last recommendation before she left him. And Freya came out on the west veranda with her light, rapid step. While going through the doorway, she managed to shake down the folds of the looped-up curtains at the end of the passage. Directly, she appeared, Heemskirk jumped up as if to fly at her. She paused, and he made her an exaggerated low bow. It irritated Freya. Oh, it's you, Mr. Heemskirk. How do you do? She spoke in her usual tone. Her face was not plainly visible to him in the dusk of the deep veranda. He dared not trust himself to speak. His rage at what he had seen was so great. And when she added with serenity, Papa will be coming in before long, he called her horrid names silently. To himself, before he spoke with contorted lips, I have seen your father already. We had a talk in the sheds. He told me some very interesting things. Oh, very, Freya sat down. She thought, he has seen us for certain. She was not ashamed. What she was afraid of was some foolish or awkward complication. But she could not conceive how much her person had been appropriated by Heemskirk in his thoughts. She tried to be conversational. You are coming now from Pale Bang, I suppose. A what? Oh, yes, I come from Pale Bang. Ha, 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 you know what your father said. He said he was afraid you were having a very dull time of it here. And I suppose you are going to cruise in the Moluccas, continued Freya who wanted to impart some useful information to Jasper if possible. At the same time, she was always glad to know that those two men were a few hundred miles apart when not under her eye. Dean Skirk growled angrily, Yes, Malakas, glaring in the direction of her shadowy figure. Your father thinks it's very quiet for you here. I tell you what, Miss Freya. There isn't such a quiet spot on earth that a woman can't find an opportunity of making a fool of somebody. Freya thought I mustn't let him provoke me. Presently the Tamil boy, who was Nelson's head servant, came in with the lights. She addressed him at once with voluble directions where to put the lamps, told him to bring the tray with the gin and bitters and to send Antonia into the house. I will have to leave you to yourself, Mr. Heemskirk, for a while, she said. And she went to her room to put on another frock. She made a quick change of it because she wished to be on the veranda before her father and the lieutenant met again. She relied on herself to regulate that evening's intercourse between these two. But Antonia, still scared and hysterical, exhibited a bruise on her arm which roused Freya's indignation. He jumped on me out of the bush like a tiger, said the girl, laughing nervously with frightened eyes. The brute thought Freya. He meant to spy on us, then. She was enraged, but the recollection of the thick Dutchman in white trousers, wide at the hips and narrow at the ankles, with his shoulder straps and black bullet head, glaring at her in the light of the lamps, was so repulsively comical that she could not help a smiling grimace. Then she became anxious. The absurdities of three men were forcing this anxiety upon her, Jasper's impetuosity. Her father's fears, Heemskirk's infatuation. She was very tender to the first two, and she made up her mind to display all her feminine diplomacy. 
All this, she said to herself, will be over and done with before very long now. Heemskirk on the veranda, lolling in a chair, his legs extended and his white cap reposing on his stomach, was lashing himself into a fury of an atrocious character altogether incomprehensible to a girl like Freya. His chin was resting on his chest. His eyes gazed stonily at his shoes. Freya examined him from behind the curtain. He didn't stir. He was ridiculous. But this absolute stillness was impressive. She stole back along the passage to the east veranda, where Jasper was sitting quietly in the dark, doing what he was told. Like a good boy, pst, she hissed. He was by her side in a moment. Yes, what is it, he murmured. It's that beetle, she whispered uneasily. Under the impression of Heemskirk's sinister immobility, she had half a mind to let Jasper know that they had been seen. But she was by no means certain that Heemskirk would tell her father, and at any rate not that evening. She concluded rapidly that the safest thing would be to get Jasper out of the way as soon as possible. What has he been doing? asked Jasper in a calm undertone. Oh, nothing, nothing. He sits there looking cross. But you know how he's always worrying Papa. Your father's quite unreasonable, pronounced Jasper judicially. I don't know, she said in a doubtful tone. Something of old Nelson's dread of the authorities had rubbed off on the girl since she had to live with it day after day. I don't know but Papa's afraid of being reduced to beggary, as he says, in his old days. Look here, kid, you had better clear out tomorrow, first thing. Jasper had hoped for another afternoon with Freya, an afternoon of quiet felicity with the girl by his side and his eyes on his brig. Anticipating a blissful future, his silence was eloquent with disappointment, and Freya understood it very well. She, too, was disappointed, but it was her business to be sensible. We shan't have a moment to ourselves with that beetle creeping round the house. She argued in a low, hurried voice. So what's the good of your staying? And he won't go while the brig's here? You know he won't. He ought to be reported for loitering, murmured Jasper with a vexed little laugh. Mind you get under way at daylight, recommended Freya under her breath. He detained her after the manner of lovers. She expostulated without struggling because it was hard for her to repulse him. He whispered into her ear while he put his arms round her. Next time we two meet, next time I hold you like this, it shall be on board. You and I in the brig all the world, all the life, and then he flashed out. I wonder I can wait. I feel as if I must carry you off now. At once. I could run with you in my hands down the path without stumbling, without touching the earth. She was still. She listened to the passion in his voice. She was saying to herself that if she were to whisper the faintest yes, if she were but to sigh lightly her consent, he would do it. He was capable of doing it without touching the earth. She closed her eyes and smiled in the dark, abandoning herself in a delightful giddiness for an instant to his encircling arm. But before he could be tempted to tighten his grasp, she was out of it, 
a foot away from him and in full possession of herself. That was the steady Freya. She was touched by the deep sigh which floated up to her from the white figure of Jasper. Who did not stir? You are a mad kid, she said tremulously. Then, with a change of tone, no one could carry me off. Not even you, I am not the sort of girl that gets carried off. His white form seemed to shrink a little before the force of that assertion, and she relented. Isn't it enough for you to know that you have that you have carried me away, she added in a tender tone. He murmured an endearing word, and she continued, I've promised you I've said I would come, and I shall come of my own free will. You shall wait for me on board. I shall get up the side by myself and walk up to you on the deck and say, Here I am. Kid. And then, and then, I shall be carried off. But it will be no man who will carry me off. It will be the brig. Your brig, our brig. I love the beauty. She heard an inarticulate sound and glided away. There was that other man on the other veranda, that dark, surly Dutchman who could make trouble between Jasper and her father. Bring about a quarrel, ugly words, and perhaps a physical collision. What a horrible situation, but, even putting aside that awful extremity, she shrank from having to live for some three months with a wretched, tormented, angry, distracted, absurd man. And when the day came, the day and the hour, what should she do if her father tried to detain her by main force as was? After all, possible, could she actually struggle with him hand to hand? But it was of lamentations and entreaties that she was really afraid. Could she withstand them? What an odious, cruel, ridiculous position would that be? But it won't be. He will say nothing, she thought as she came out quickly on the west veranda, and, seeing that he skirt did not move, sat down on a chair near the doorway and kept her eyes on him. The outraged lieutenant had not changed his attitude, only his cap had fallen off his stomach and was lying on the floor. His thick black eyebrows were knitted by a frown, while he looked at her out of the corners of his eyes, and their sideways glance in conjunction with the hooked nose, the whole bulky, ungainly, sprawling person, struck Freya as so comically moody that, inwardly discomposed as she was, she could not help smiling. She did her best to give that smile a conciliatory character. She did not want to provoke Heemskirk needlessly, and the lieutenant, perceiving that smile, was mollified. It never entered his head that his outward appearance a naval officer in uniform could appear ridiculous to that girl of no position, the daughter of old Nielsen. The recollection of her arms round Jasper's neck still irritated and excited him. The hussy, he thought, smiling, eh, that's how you are amusing yourself. Fooling your father finely, aren't you? You have a taste for that sort of fun, have you? Well, we shall see. He did not alter his position. But on his pursed-up lips there also appeared a smile of surly and ill-omened amusement, while his eyes returned to the contemplation of his boots. Freya felt hot with indignation. She sat radiantly fair in the lamplight, her strong, well-shaped hands lying one on top of the other in her lap. Odious creature, she thought, her face colored with sudden anger. 
You have scared my maid out of her senses, she said aloud. What possessed you? He was thinking so deeply of her that the sound of her voice, pronouncing these unexpected words, startled him extremely. He jerked up his head and looked so bewildered that Freya insisted impatiently. I mean, Antonia, you have bruised her arm. What did you do it for? Do you want to quarrel with me? he asked thickly with a sort of amazement. He blinked like an owl. He was funny, Freya, like all women had a keen sense of the ridiculous in outward appearance. Well, no, I don't think I do. She could not help herself. She laughed outright, a clear, nervous laugh in which he skirt joined suddenly with a harsh ha, ha, ha. Voices and footsteps were heard in the passage, and Jasper, with old Nelson, came out. Old Nelson looked at his daughter approvingly, for he liked the lieutenant to be kept in good humor. And he also joined sympathetically in the laugh. Now, lieutenant, we shall have some dinner, he said, rubbing his hands cheerily. Jasper had gone straight to the balustrade. The sky was full of stars, and in the blue velvety night the cove below had a denser blackness in which the riding lights of the brig and of the gunboat glimmered redly, like suspended sparks. Next time, this riding light glimmers down there. I will be waiting for her on the quarter-deck to come and say here I am. Jasper thought, and his heart seemed to grow bigger in his chest, dilated by an oppressive happiness that nearly wrung out a cry from him. There was no wind, not a leaf below him stirred, and even the sea was but a still uncomplaining shadow. Far away on the unclouded sky the pale lightning, the heat lightning of the tropics, played tremulously amongst the low stars in short. Faint, mysteriously consecutive flashes, like incomprehensible signals from some distant planet, the dinner passed off quietly. Freya sat facing her father, calm but pale. Heemskirk affected to talk only to old Nelson. Jasper's behavior was exemplary. He kept his eyes under control, basking in the sense of Freya's nearness, as people bask in the sun without looking up to heaven. And very soon after dinner was over, Mindful of his instructions, he declared that it was time for him to go on board his ship. Heemskirk did not look up, ensconced in the rocking chair, and puffing at a cherut, he had the air of meditating surlily over some odious outbreak. So at least it seemed to Freya, old Nelson said at once, I will stroll down with you. He had begun a professional conversation about the dangers of the New Guinea coast, and wanted to relate to Jasper some experience of his own over there. Jasper was such a good listener, Freya made as if to accompany them, but her father frowned, shook his head, and nodded significantly towards the immovable heemskirk blotting out smoke with half-closed eyes and protruded lips. The lieutenant must not be left alone. Take offense, perhaps. Freya obeyed these signs. Perhaps it is better for me to stay, she thought. Women are not generally prone to review their own conduct. The embarrassing masculine absurdities are in the main responsible for its ethics. But, looking at Heemskirk, Freya felt regret and even remorse. His thick bulk in repose suggested the idea of repletion, 
but as a matter of fact he had eaten very little. He had drunk a great deal, however. The fleshy lobes of his unpleasant big ears with deeply folded rims were crimson. They quite flamed in the neighborhood of the flat, sallow cheeks. For a considerable time, he did not raise his heavy brown eyelids. To be at the mercy of such a creature was humiliating, and Freya, who always ended by being frank with herself, thought regretfully, if only I had been open with Papa from the first, but then what an impossible life he would have led me, yes. Men were absurd in many ways, lovably like Jasper, impracticably like her father, odiously like that grotesquely supine creature in the chair. Was it possible to talk him over? Perhaps it was not necessary. Oh, I can't talk to him, she thought. And when Heemskirk, still without looking at her, began resolutely to crush his half-smoked cheroot on the coffee tray, she took alarm, glided towards the piano, opened it in tremendous haste, and struck the keys before she sat down. In an instant the veranda, the whole carpetless wooden bungalow raised on piles, became filled with an uproarious, confused resonance. But through it all she heard, she felt on the floor the heavy, prowling footsteps of the lieutenant moving to and fro at her back. He was not exactly drunk, but he was sufficiently primed to make the suggestions of his excited imagination seem perfectly feasible and even clever. Beautifully, unscrupulously clever Freya, aware that he had stopped just behind her, went on playing without turning her head. She played with spirit, brilliantly, a fierce piece of music, but when his voice reached her she went cold all over. It was the voice, not the words. The insolent familiarity of tone dismayed her to such an extent that she could not understand at first what he was saying. His utterance was thick, too. I suspected. Of course, I suspected something of your little goings-on. I am not a child. But from suspecting to seeing, seeing, you understand there's an enormous difference. That sort of thing, come, one isn't made of stone. And when a man has been worried by a girl, as I have been worried by you, Miss Freya sleeping and waking, then, of course, but I am a man of the world. It must be dull for you here. I say, won't you leave off this confounded playing? This last was the only sentence really which she made out. She shook her head negatively, and in desperation put on the loud pedal but she could not make the sound of the piano cover his raised voice. Only, I am surprised that you should. An English trading skipper, a common fellow. Lo, cheeky lot infesting these islands. I would make short work of such trash, while you have here a good friend. A gentleman ready to worship at your feet, your pretty feet, an officer a man of family. Strange, isn't it? But what of that? You are fit for a prince. Freya did not turn her head. Her face went stiff with horror and indignation. This adventure was altogether beyond her conception of what was possible. It was not in her character to jump up and run away. It seemed to her, too, that if she did move there was no saying what might happen. Presently her father would be back, and then the other would have to leave off. It was best to ignore to ignore, 
She went on playing loudly and correctly, as though she were alone, as if Heemskirk did not exist. That proceeding irritated him. Come, you may deceive your father. He bawled angrily, but I am not to be made a fool of. Stop this infernal noise. Freya, hey, you Scandinavian goddess of love, stop, do you hear? That's what you are of love. But the heathen gods are only devils in disguise, and that's what you are too, a deep little devil. Stop it, I say, or I will lift you off that stool. Standing behind her, he devoured her with his eyes. From the golden crown of her rigidly motionless head to the heels of her shoes, the line of her shapely shoulders, the curves of her fine figure swaying a little before the keyboard. She had on a light dress. The sleeves stopped short at the elbows in an edging of lace. A satin ribbon encircled her waist. In an access of irresistible, reckless hopefulness, he clapped both his hands on that waist, and then the irritating music stopped at last. But quick as she was in springing away from the contact, the round music stool going over with a crash. Heemskirk's lips, aiming at her neck, landed a hungry, smacking kiss just under her ear. A deep silence reigned for a time, and then he laughed rather feebly. He was disconcerted somewhat by her white, still face, the big light violet eyes resting on him stonily. She had not uttered a sound. She faced him. Steadying herself on the corner of the piano with one extended hand, the other went on rubbing with mechanical persistency the place his lips had touched. What's the trouble? he said, offended. Startled you, look here. Don't let us have any of that nonsense. You don't mean to say a kiss frightens you so much as all that. I know better. I don't mean to be left out in the cold. He had been gazing into her face with such strained intentness that he could no longer see it distinctly. Everything round him was rather misty. He forgot the overturned stool, caught his foot against it, and lurched forward slightly, saying in an ingratiating tone, I am not bad fun, really. You try a few kisses to begin with, he said no more, because his head received a terrific concussion, accompanied by an explosive sound. Freya had swung her round, strong arm with such force that the impact of her open palm on his flat cheek turned him half round, uttering a faint, hoarse yell. The lieutenant clapped both his hands to the left side of his face, which had taken on suddenly a dusky brick red tinge. Freya, very erect, her violet eyes darkened, her palms still tingling from the blow, a sort of restrained, determined smile, showing a tiny gleam of her white teeth. Heard her father's rapid, heavy tread on the path below the veranda. Her expression lost its pugnacity and became sincerely concerned. She was sorry for her father. She stooped quickly to pick up the music stool, as if anxious to obliterate the traces. But that was no good. She had resumed her attitude, one hand resting lightly on the piano, before old Nelson got up to the top of the stairs. Poor father, how furious he will be, how upset. And afterwards, what tremors, what unhappiness. Why had she not been open with him from the first? His round, innocent stare of amazement cut her to the quick. But he was not looking at her. 
His stare was directed to Heemskirk, who, with his back to him, and with his hands still up to his face, was hissing curses through his teeth, and she saw him in profile glaring at her balefully with one black. Evil eye, what's the matter? asked old Nelson, very much bewildered. She did not answer him. She thought of Jasper on the deck of the brig, gazing up at the lighted bungalow. And she felt frightened. It was a mercy that one of them at least was on board out of the way. She only wished he were a hundred miles off, and yet she was not certain that she did. Had Jasper been mysteriously moved that moment to reappear on the veranda, she would have thrown her consistency, her firmness, her self possession to the winds and flown into his arms. What is it, what is it? insisted the unsuspecting Nelson, getting quite excited. Only this minute you were playing a tune, and Freya, unable to speak in her apprehension of what was coming, she was also fascinated by that black, evil, glaring eye only nodded slightly at the lieutenant, as much as to say, just look at him. Why, yes, exclaimed old Nelson. I see what on earth. Meantime, he had cautiously approached Team Skirk, who, bursting into incoherent imprecations, was stamping with both feet where he stood. The indignity of the blow, the rage of baffled purpose, the ridicule of the exposure, and the impossibility of revenge maddened him to a point when he simply felt he must howl with fury. Oh, 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 he howled, stamping across the veranda as though he meant to drive his foot through the floor at every step. Why is his face hurt? asked the astounded old Nelson. The truth dawned suddenly upon his innocent mind. Dear me, he cried, enlightened. Get some brandy, quick, Freya. You are subject to it, Lieutenant. Fiendish. A, hey, I know, I know. Used to go crazy all of a sudden myself in the time. And the little bottle of laudanum from the medicine chest. To Freya. Look sharp. Don't you see he's got a toothache? And, indeed, what other explanation could have presented itself to the guileless old Nelson? Beholding this cheek nursed with both hands, these wild glances, these stampings, this distracted swaying of the body, it would have demanded a preternatural acuteness to hit upon the true cause. Freya had not moved. She watched Heemskirk's savagely inquiring, black stare directed stealthily upon herself. Aha, uh -huh, you would like to be let off, she said to herself. She looked at him unflinchingly, thinking it out. The temptation of making an end of it all without further trouble was irresistible. She gave an almost imperceptible nod of assent, and glided away. Hurry up that brandy, old Nelson shouted, as she disappeared in the passage. Heemskirk relieved his deeper feelings by a sudden string of curses in Dutch and English which he sent after her. He raved to his heart's content, flinging to and fro the veranda and kicking chairs out of his way. Nelson or Nielsen, whose sympathy was profoundly stirred by these evidences of agonizing pain, hovered round his dear and dreaded lieutenant, fussing like an old hen. Dear me, dear me, is it so bad? I know well what it is. I used to frighten my poor wife sometimes. Do you get it often like this, lieutenant? 
Dean Skirk shouldered him viciously out of his way, with a short, insane laugh. But his staggering host took it in good part. A man beside himself with excruciating toothache is not responsible. Go into my room, Lieutenant, he suggested urgently. We will get something to ease you in a minute. He seized the poor sufferer by the arm and forced him gently onwards to the very bed, on which Heemskirk, in a renewed access of rage, flung himself down with such force that he rebounded from the mattress to the height of quite a foot. Dear me, exclaimed the scared Nelson, and incontinently ran off to hurry up the brandy and the laudanum. Very angry that so little alacrity was shown in relieving the tortures of his precious guest. In the end, he got these things himself. Half an hour later, he stood in the inner passage of the house. Surprised by faint, spasmodic sounds of a mysterious nature, between laughter and sobs, he frowned then went straight towards his daughter's room and knocked at the door. Freya, her glorious fair hair framing her white face and rippling down a dark blue dressing gown, opened it partly. A light in the room was dim. Antonia, crouching in a corner, rocked herself backwards and forwards, uttering feeble moans. Old Nelson had not much experience in various kinds of feminine laughter, but he was certain there had been laughter there. Very unfeeling, very unfeeling, he said with weighty displeasure. What is there so amusing in a man being in pain? I should have thought a woman a young girl. He was so funny, murmured Freya whose eyes glistened strangely in the semi-obscurity of the passage. And then, you know, I don't like him, she added in an unsteady voice. Funny, repeated old Nelson, amazed at this evidence of callousness in one so young. You don't like him, do you mean to say that? Because you don't like him, you why, it's simply cruel. Don't you know it's about the worst sort of pain there is? Dogs have been known to go mad with it. He certainly seemed to have gone mad, Freya said with an effort, as if she were struggling with some hidden feeling. But her father was launched, and you know how he is. He notices everything. He is a fellow to take offense for the least little thing regular Dutchman, and I want to keep friendly with him. It's like this, my girl, if that Raja of ours were to do something silly and you know he is a sulky, rebellious beggar and the authorities took into their heads that my influence over him was good. You would find yourself without a roof over your head. She cried, what nonsense, father, in a not very assured tone, and discovered that he was angry, angry enough to achieve irony. Yes, old Nelson or Nielsen, irony, just a gleam of it. Oh, of course, if you have means of your own a mansion, a plantation, that I know nothing of but he was not capable of sustained irony. I tell you they would bundle me out of here, he whispered forcibly, without compensation, of course. I know these Dutch, and the lieutenant's just the fellow to start the trouble going. He has the ear of influential officials. I wouldn't offend him for anything for anything on no consideration whatever. What did you say? It was only an inarticulate exclamation. If she ever had a half-formed intention of telling him everything, she had given it up now. 
It was impossible, both out of regard for his dignity and for the peace of his poor mind. I don't care for him myself very much, old Nelson's subdued undertone confessed in a sigh. He's easier now, he went on, after a silence. I've given him up my bed for the night. I shall sleep on my veranda, in the hammock. No, I can't say I like him either, but from that to laugh at a man because he's driven crazy with pain is a long way. You've surprised me, Freya. That side of his face is quite flushed. Her shoulders shook convulsively under his hands, which he laid on her paternally. His straggly, wiry moustache brushed her forehead in a good-night kiss. She closed the door and went away from it to the middle of the room before she allowed herself a tired-out sort of laugh. Without buoyancy, flushed, a little flushed, she repeated to herself. I hope so, indeed, a little. Her eyelashes were wet. Antonia, in her corner, moaned and giggled, and it was impossible to tell where the moans ended and the giggles began. The mistress and the maid had been somewhat hysterical for Freya on fleeing into her room, had found Antonia there, and had told her everything. I have avenged you, my girl, she exclaimed. And then they had laughingly cried and cryingly laughed with admonitions SSH. Not so loud, be quiet, on one part and interludes of I am so frightened. He's an evil man on the other. Antonia was very much afraid of Heemskirk. She was afraid of him because of his personal appearance, because of his eyes and his eyebrows, and his mouth and his nose and his limbs. Nothing could be more rational. And she thought him an evil man, because... To her eyes, he looked evil. No ground for an opinion could be sounder. In the dimness of the room, with only a nightlight burning at the head of Freya's bed, the camerista crept out of her corner to crouch at the feet of her mistress, supplicating in whispers. There's the brig, Captain Allen. Let us run away at once, oh. Let us run away, I am so frightened. Let us, let us, I run away, thought Freya to herself, without looking down at the scared girl. Never, both the resolute mistress under the mosquito net and the frightened maid lying curled up on a mat at the foot of the bed did not sleep very well that night. The person that did not sleep at all was Lieutenant Heemskirk. He lay on his back staring vindictively in the darkness. Inflaming images and humiliating reflections succeeded each other in his mind, keeping up, augmenting his anger. A pretty tale this to get about, but it must not be allowed to get about. The outrage had to be swallowed in silence. A pretty affair fooled, led on, and struck by the girl and probably fooled by the father. 2. But number Nielsen was but another victim of that shameless hussy, that brazen minx, that sly laughing. Kissing, lying, no, he did not deceive me on purpose, thought the tormented lieutenant. But I should like to pay him off all the same for being such an imbecile. Well, some day, perhaps. One thing he was firmly resolved on, he had made up his mind to steal early out of the house. He did not think he could face the girl without going out of his mind with fury. Fire and Perdition, 
ten thousand devils. I shall choke here before the morning, he muttered to himself. Lying rigid on his back on old Nelson's bed, his breast heaving for air, he arose at daylight and started cautiously to open the door. Faint sounds in the passage alarmed him, and remaining concealed, he saw Freya coming out. This unexpected sight deprived him of all power to move away from the crack of the door. It was the narrowest crack possible, but commanding the view of the end of the veranda. Freya made for that end hastily to watch the brig passing the point. She wore her dark dressing gown. Her feet were bare, because, having fallen asleep towards the morning, she ran out headlong in her fear of being too late. Heemskirk had never seen her looking like this, with her hair drawn back smoothly to the shape of her head, and hanging in one heavy, fair tress down her back, and with that air of extreme youth, intensity, and eagerness. And at first he was amazed, and then he gnashed his teeth, he could not face her at all. He muttered a curse and kept still behind the door. With a low, deep breathed awe, when she first saw the brig already under way, she reached for Nelson's long glass reposing on brackets high up the wall. The wide sleeve of the dressing gown slipped back, uncovering her white arm as far as the shoulder. Dean Skirk, gripping the door handle, as if to crush it, felt like a man just risen to his feet from a drinking bout. And Freya knew that he was watching her. She knew. She had seen the door move as she came out of the passage. She was aware of his eyes being on her, with scornful bitterness, with triumphant contempt. You are there, she thought leveling the long glass. Oh, well, look on, then. The green islets appeared like black shadows. The ashen sea was smooth as glass. The clear robe of the colorless dawn, in which even the brig appeared shadowy, had a hem of light in the east. Directly Freya had made out Jasper on deck, with his own long glass directed to the bungalow, she laid hers down and raised both her beautiful white arms above her head. In that attitude of supreme cry she stood still, glowing with the consciousness of Jasper's adoration going out to her figure held in the field of his glass away there, and warmed, too, by the feeling of evil passion, the burning, covetous eyes of the other, fastened on her back, in the fervor of her love, in the caprice of her mind, and with that mysterious knowledge of masculine nature women seem to be born to. She thought, you are looking on you, will you must, then you shall see something. She brought both her hands to her lips, then flung them out, sending a kiss over the sea, as if she wanted to throw her heart along with it on the deck of the brig. Her face was rosy, her eyes shone, her repeated passionate gesture seemed to fling kisses by the hundred again and again and again. While the slowly ascending sun brought the glory of color to the world, turning the islets green, the sea blue, the brig below her white dazzlingly white in the spread of her wings with the red ensign streaming like a tiny flame from the peak, and each time she murmured with a rising inflection, Take this and this and this till suddenly her arms fell. She had seen the ensign dipped in response, and next moment the point below hid the hull of the brig from her view. Then she turned away from the balustrade, 
and passing slowly before the door of her father's room with her eyelids lowered. And an enigmatic expression on her face, she disappeared behind the curtain. But instead of going along the passage, she remained concealed and very still on the other side to watch what would happen. For some time the broad, furnished veranda remained empty. Then the door of old Nelson's room came open suddenly, and Heemskirk staggered out. His hair was rumpled, his eyes bloodshot, his unshaven face looked very dark. He gazed wildly about, saw his cap on a table, snatched it up, and made for the stairs quietly, but with a strange, tottering gait, like the last effort of waning strength. Shortly after his head had sunk below the level of the floor, Freya came out from behind the curtain, with compressed, scheming lips and no softness at all in her luminous eyes. He could not be allowed to sneak off scot-free. Never, never. She was excited. She tingled all over. She had tasted blood. He must be made to understand that she had been aware of having been watched. He must know that he had been seen slinking off shamefully. But to run to the front rail and shout after him would have been childish, crude, undignified. And to shout what? What word? What phrase? No, it was impossible. Then how? She frowned, discovered it, dashed at the piano, which had stood open all night, and made the rosewood monster growl savagery in an irritated bass. She struck chords, as if firing shots after that straddling, broad figure in ample white trousers, and a dark uniform jacket with gold shoulder straps. And then she pursued him with the same thing she had played the evening before a modern, fierce piece of love music which had been tried more than once against the thunderstorms of the group. She accentuated its rhythm with triumphant malice, so absorbed in her purpose that she did not notice the presence of her father, who, wearing an old threadbare ulster of a check pattern over his sleeping suit, had run out from the back veranda to inquire the reason of this untimely performance. He stared at her. What on earth? What's become of the lieutenant? He shouted. She looked up at him as if her soul were lost in her music. With unseeing eyes, gone, wa tea, where? She shook her head slightly and went on playing louder than before. Old Nelson's innocently anxious gaze, starting from the open door of his room, explored the whole place high and low as if the lieutenant were something small which might have been crawling on the floor or clinging to a wall. But a shrill whistle coming somewhere from below pierced the ample volume of sound rolling out of the piano in great vibrating waves. The lieutenant was down at the cove, whistling for the boat to come and take him off to his ship and he seemed to be in a terrific hurry, too, for he whistled again almost directly, waited for a moment, and then sent out a long, interminable, shrill call as distressful to hear as though he had shrieked without drawing breath. Freya ceased playing suddenly, going on board, said old Nelson, perturbed by the event. What could have made him clear out so early, queer chap? Devilishly touchy, too. I shouldn't wonder if it was your conduct last night that hurt his feelings. I noticed you. Freya, you as well as laughed in his face while he was suffering agonies from neuralgia. 
It isn't the way to get yourself liked. He's offended with you. Freya's hands now reposed passive on the keys. She bowed her fair head, feeling a sudden discontent, a nervous lassitude, as though she had passed through some exhausting crisis. Old Nelson or Nielsen, looking aggrieved, was revolving matters of policy in his bald head. I think it would be right for me to go on board just to inquire sometime this morning, he declared fussily. Why don't they bring me my morning tea, do you hear, Freya? You have astonished me, I must say. I didn't think a young girl could be so unfeeling, and the lieutenant thinks himself a friend of ours, too, what, know her well. He calls himself a friend, and that's something to a person in my position. Certainly, oh, yes, I must go on board. Must you, murmured Freya listlessly, then added, in her thought, poor man. Chapter V In respect of the next seven weeks, all that is necessary to say is, first, that old Nelson or Nielsen failed in paying his politic call. The Neptune gunboat of H.M., the King of the Netherlands, commanded by an outraged and infuriated lieutenant, left the cove at an unexpectedly early hour, when Freya's father came down to the shore, after seeing his precious crop of tobacco spread out properly in the sun. She was already steaming round the point. Old Nelson regretted the circumstance for many days. Now, I don't know in what disposition the man went away. He lamented to his hard daughter. He was amazed at her hardness. He was almost frightened by her indifference. Next, it must be recorded that the same day the gunboat Neptun, steering east, passed the brig Benito becalmed in sight of Caramata. With her head to the eastward, too, her captain, Jasper Allen, giving himself up consciously to a tender. Possessive reverie of his Freya did not get out of his long chair on the poop to look at the Neptune which passed so close that the smoke belching out suddenly from her short black funnel rolled between the masts of the Benito. Obscuring for a moment the sunlit whiteness of her sails, consecrated to the service of love. Jasper did not even turn his head for a glance, but Heemskirk, on the bridge, had gazed long and earnestly at the brig from the distance. Gripping hard the brass rail in front of him, till, the two ships closing, he lost all confidence in himself, and retreating to the chart room, pulled the door to with a crash. There, his brows knitted, his mouth drawn on one side in sardonic meditation, he sat through many still hours a sort of Prometheus in the bonds of unholy desire, having his very vitals torn by the beak and claws of humiliated passion. That species of fowl is not to be shooed off as easily as a chicken. Fooled, cheated, deceived, led on, outraged, mocked at beak and claws, a sinister bird, the lieutenant had no mind to become the talk of the archipelago. As the naval officer who had had his face slapped by a girl, was it possible? that she really loved that rascally traitor. He tried not to think, but worse than thoughts. Definite impressions beset him in his retreat. He saw her a vision plain, close to detailed, plastic. Colored, lighted up, he saw her hanging round the neck of that fellow. And he shut his eyes, only to discover 
that this was no remedy. Then a piano began to play nearby very plainly, and he put his fingers to his ears with no better effect. It was not to be borne not in solitude. He bolted out of the chart room and talked of indifferent things somewhat wildly with the officer of the watch on the bridge. To the mocking accompaniment of a ghostly piano, the last thing to be recorded is that Lieutenant Heemskirk, instead of pursuing his course towards Ternate, where he was expected, went out of his way to call at Macassar, where no one was looking for his arrival. Once there, he gave certain explanations and laid a certain proposal before the governor or some other authority, and obtained permission to do what he thought fit in these matters. Thereupon the Neptune, giving up Ternate altogether, steamed north in view of the mountainous coast of Celebs, and then, crossing the broad straits, took up her station on the low coast of virgin forests, inviolate and mute. In waters phosphorescent at night, deep blue in daytime, with gleaming green patches over the submerged reefs. For days the Neptune could be seen moving smoothly up and down the somber face of the shore or hanging about with a watchful air near the silvery breaks of broad estuaries. Under the great luminous sky never softened, never veiled, and flooding the earth with the everlasting sunshine of the tropics, that sunshine which, in its unbroken splendor, oppresses the soul with an inexpressible melancholy more intimate, more penetrating, more profound than the grey sadness of the northern mists. The trading brig Benito appeared gliding round a sombre forest-clad point of land on the silvery estuary of a great river. The breath of air that gave her motion would not have fluttered the flame of a torch. She stole out into the open from behind a veil of unstirring leaves, mysteriously silent, ghostly white, and solemnly stealthy in her imperceptible progress, and Jasper, his elbow in the main rigging, and his head leaning against his hand. Thought of Freya, everything in the world reminded him of her. The beauty of the loved woman exists in the beauties of nature. The swelling outlines of the hills, the curves of a coast, the free sinuosities of a river are less suave than the harmonious lines of her body. And when she moves, gliding lightly, the grace of her progress suggests the power of occult forces, which rule the fascinating aspects of the visible world. Dependent on things as all men are, Jasper loved his vessel the house of his dreams. He lent to her something of Freya's soul. Her deck was the foothold of their love. The possession of his brig appeased his passion in a soothing certitude of happiness already conquered. The full moon was some way up perfect and serene, floating in air as calm and limpid as the glance of Freya's eyes. There was not a sound in the brig. Here she shall stand, by my side, on evenings like this, he thought, with rapture, and it was at that moment, in this peace, in this serenity, under the full, benign gaze of the moon propitious to lovers, on a sea without a wrinkle, under a sky without a cloud, as if all nature had assumed its most clement mood in a spirit of mockery that the gunboat Neptune, detaching herself from the dark coast under which she had been lying invisible, steamed out to intercept the trading brig Benito standing out to sea. Directly the gunboat had been made out emerging from her ambush, 
Schultz, of the fascinating voice, had given signs of strange agitation. All that day, ever since leaving the Malay town up the river, he had shown a haggard face, going about his duties like a man with something weighing on his mind. Jasper had noticed it, but the mate, turning away, as though he had not liked being looked at, had muttered shamefacedly of a headache and a touch of fever. He must have had it very badly when, dodging behind his captain, he wondered aloud, what can that fellow want with us? A naked man standing in a freezing blast and trying not to shiver could not have spoken with a more harshly uncertain intonation. But it might have been fever a cold fit. He wants to make himself disagreeable, simply, said Jasper, with perfect good humor. He has tried it on me before, however. We shall soon see. And, indeed, before long the two vessels lay abreast within easy hail. The brig, with her fine lines and her white sails, looked vaporous and sylph-like in the moonlight. The gunboat, short, squat, with her stumpy dark spars naked like dead trees, raised against the luminous sky of that resplendent night threw a heavy shadow on the lane of water between the two ships. Freya haunted them both like an ubiquitous spirit, and as if she were the only woman in the world. Jasper remembered her earnest recommendation to be guarded and cautious in all his acts and words while he was away from her. In this quite unforeseen encounter he felt on his ear the very breath of these hurried admonitions customary to the last moment of their partings. Heard the half-jesting final whisper of the mind, Kid, I should never forgive you, with a quick pressure on his arm, which he answered by a quiet, confident smile. Heemskirk was haunted in another fashion. There were no whispers in it. It was more like visions. He saw that girl hanging round the neck of a low vagabond that vagabond, the vagabond who had just answered his hail. He saw her stealing barefooted across a veranda with great, clear, wide open, eager eyes to look at a brig that brig. If she had shrieked, scolded, called names. But she had simply triumphed over him. That was all. Led on, he firmly believed it. Fooled, deceived, outraged, struck, mocked at. Beak and claws, the two men, so differently haunted by Freya of the Seven Isles, were not equally matched. In the intense stillness, as of sleep, which had fallen upon the two vessels, in a world that itself seemed but a delicate dream, a boat pulled by Javanese sailors crossing the dark lane of water came alongside the brig. The white warrant officer in her, perhaps the gunner, climbed aboard. He was a short man with a rotund stomach and a wheezy voice. His immovable fat face looked lifeless in the moonlight, and he walked with his thick arms hanging away from his body as though he had been stuffed. His cunning little eyes glittered like bits of mica. He conveyed to Jasper, in broken English, a request to come on board the Neptune. Jasper had not expected anything so unusual, 
but after a short reflection, he decided to show neither annoyance nor even surprise. The river from which he had come had been politically disturbed for a couple of years, and he was aware that his visits there were looked upon with some suspicion. He did not mind much the displeasure of the authorities, so terrifying to old Nelson. He prepared to leave the brig, and Schultz followed him to the rail as if to say something, but in the end stood by in silence. Jasper, getting over the side, noticed his ghastly face. The eyes of the man who had found salvation in the brig from the effects of his peculiar psychology looked at him with a dumb, beseeching expression. What's the matter? Jasper asked. I wonder how this will end, said he of the beautiful voice, which had even fascinated the steady Freya herself. But where was its charming timbre now? These words had sounded like a raven's croak. You are ill, said Jasper positively. I wish I were dead was the startling statement uttered by Schultz talking to himself in the extremity of some mysterious trouble. Jasper gave him a keen glance, but this was not the time to investigate the morbid outbreak of a feverish man. He did not look as though he were actually delirious, and that for the moment must suffice. Schultz made a dart forward. That fellow means harm he said desperately. He means harm to you, Captain Allen. I feel it, and I... He choked with inexplicable emotion. All right, Schultz. I won't give him an opening. Jasper cut him short and swung himself into the boat. On board the Nepton Heemskirk, Standing straddle legs in the flood of moonlight, his inky shadow falling right across the quarter deck, made no sign at his approach, but secretly he felt something like the heave of the sea in his chest at the sight of that man. Jasper waited before him in silence. Brought face to face in direct personal contact, they fell at once into the manner of their casual meetings in old Nelson's bungalow. They ignored each other's existence, Heemskirk moodily, Jasper, with a perfectly colorless quietness. What's going on in that river you've just come out of? asked the lieutenant straight away. I know nothing of the troubles, if you mean that, Jasper answered. I've landed there half a cargo of rice, for which I got nothing in exchange, and went away. There's no trade there now, but they would have been starving in another week if I had turned up. Meddling, English meddling, and suppose the rascals don't deserve anything better than to starve, eh? There are women and children there, you know observed Jasper in his even tone. Oh, yes, when an Englishman talks of women and children, you may be sure there's something fishy about the business. Your doings will have to be investigated. They spoke in turn, as though they had been disembodied spirits, mere voices in empty air. For they looked at each other as if there had been nothing there, or, at most, with as much recognition as one gives to an inanimate object. And no more, but now a silence fell. Heemskirk had thought, all at once, she will tell him all about it. She will tell him while she hangs round his neck laughing. And the sudden desire to annihilate Jasper on the spot almost deprived him of his senses by its vehemence. He lost the power of speech and of vision. For a moment he absolutely couldn't see Jasper. 
but he heard him inquiring, as of the world at large. Am I, then, to conclude that the brig is detained? Heemskirk made a recovery in a flush of malignant satisfaction. She is. I am going to take her to Macassar in tow. The courts will have to decide on the legality of this, said Jasper, aware that the matter was becoming serious, but with assumed indifference. Oh, yes, the courts, certainly. And as to you, I shall keep you on board here. Jasper's dismay at being parted from his ship was betrayed by a stony immobility. It lasted but an instant. Then he turned away and hailed the brig. Mr. Schultz answered, Yes, sir, get ready to receive a tow rope from the gunboat. We are going to be taken to Macassar. Good God, what's that for, sir, came an anxious cry faintly. Kindness, I suppose, Jasper, ironical, shouted with great deliberation. We might have been becalmed in here for days. And hospitality. I am invited to stay on board here. The answer to this information was a loud ejaculation of distress. Jasper thought anxiously, why, the fellow's nerves gone to pieces, and with an awkward uneasiness of a new sort. Looked intently at the brig, the thought that he was parted from her for the first time, since they came together shook the apparently careless fortitude of his character to its very foundations, which were deep. All that time neither Heemskirk nor even his inky shadow had stirred in the least. I am going to send a boat's crew and an officer on board your vessel, he announced to no one in particular. Jasper, tearing himself away from the absorbed contemplation of the brig, turned round, and without passion, almost without expression in his voice, entered his protest against the whole of the proceedings. What he was thinking of was the delay. He counted the days. The casser was actually on his way, and to be towed there really saved time. On the other hand, there would be some vexing formalities to go through. But the thing was too absurd. The beetle's gone mad, he thought. I will be released at once. And if not, Messman must enter into a bond for me. Messman was a Dutch merchant with whom Jasper had had many dealings, a considerable person in Macassar. You protest, H.M., Heemskirk muttered and for a little longer remained motionless, his legs planted well apart, and his head lowered as though he were studying his own comical, deeply split shadow. Then he made a sign to the rotund gunner, who had kept at hand, motionless like a vilely stuffed specimen of a fat man. With a lifeless face and glittering little eyes, the fellow approached and stood at attention. You will board the brig with a boat's crew. Ya, yeah, min hair. You will have one of your men to steer her all the time, went on Heemskirk, giving his orders in English. Apparently for Jasper's edification, you hear, ya, yeah, min hair. You will remain on deck and in charge all the time. Yeah, Minhair Jasper felt as if, together with the command of the brig, his very heart were being taken out of his breast. Eemskirk asked, with a change of tone, What weapons have you on board? At one time all the ships trading in the China Seas 
had a license to carry a certain quantity of firearms for purposes of defense. Jasper answered, 18 rifles with their bayonets, which were on board when I bought her, four years ago. They have been declared, where are they kept? For cabin. Pete has the key, you will take possession of them, said Heemskirk to the gunner. Yeah, Minher, what is this for? What do you mean to imply? cried out Jasper, then bit his lip. It's monstrous, he muttered. Heemskirk raised for a moment a heavy, as if suffering, glance. You may go, he said to his gunner. The fat man saluted and departed. During the next thirty hours the steady towing was interrupted once. At a signal from the brig, made by waving a flag on the forecastle, the gunboat was stopped. The badly stuffed specimen of a warrant officer, getting into his boat, arrived on board the Nepton and hurried straight into his commander's cabin. His excitement at something he had to communicate being betrayed by the blinking of his small eyes. These two were closeted together for some time, while Jasper at the taffrail tried to make out if anything out of the common had occurred on board the brig. But nothing seemed to be amiss on board, however, he kept a lookout for the gunner, and Though he had avoided speaking to anybody since he had finished with Heemskirk, he stopped that man when he came out on deck again to ask how his mate was. He was feeling not very well when I left, he explained. The fat warrant officer, holding himself as though the effort of carrying his big stomach in front of him demanded a rigid carriage, understood with difficulty. Not a single one of his features showed the slightest animation, but his little eyes blinked rapidly at last. Oh, yeah, the mate, yeah, yeah, he is very well, but, main got, he is one very funny man. Jasper could get no explanation of that remark, because the Dutchman got into the boat hurriedly, and went back on board the brig. But he consoled himself with the thought that very soon all this unpleasant and rather absurd experience would be over. The roadstead of Macassar was in sight already. Heemskirk passed by him going on the bridge. For the first time the lieutenant looked at Jasper with marked intention and the strange roll of his eyes was so funny it had been long agreed by Jasper and Freya that the lieutenant was funny so ecstatically gratified. As though he were rolling a tasty morsel on his tongue, that Jasper could not help a broad smile. And then he turned to his brig again, to see her, his cherished possession, animated by something of his Freya's soul. The only foothold of two lives on the wide earth, the security of his passion, the companion of adventure. The power to snatch the calm, adorable Freya to his breast, and carry her off to the end of the world. To see this beautiful thing embodying worthily his pride and his love, to see her captive at the end of a tow rope was not indeed a pleasant experience. It had something nightmarish in it, as, for instance, the dream of a wild sea bird loaded with chains. Yet, what else could he want to look at? Her beauty would sometimes come to his heart with the force of a spell, so that he would forget where he was. And, besides, that sense of superiority which the certitude of being loved gives to a young man, that illusion of being set above the fates by a tender look in a woman's eyes helped him, the first shock over, 
to go through these experiences with an amused self-confidence. For what evil could touch the elect of Freya? It was now afternoon, the sun being behind the two vessels as they headed for the harbor. The beetle's little joke shall soon be over, thought Jasper, without any great animosity. As a seaman well acquainted with that part of the world, a casual glance was enough to tell him what was being done. Hello, he thought, he is going through Spermond Passage. We shall be rounding Tamiser Reef presently. And again he returned to the contemplation of his brig, that mainstay of his material and emotional existence which would be soon in his hands again. On a sea, calm like a mill pond, a heavy smooth ripple undulated and streamed away from her bows, for the powerful Neptune was towing at great speed. As if for a wager, the Dutch gunner appeared on the forecastle of the Benito, and with him a couple of men. They stood looking at the coast, and Jasper lost himself in a lover-like trance. The deep-toned blast of the gunboat's steam whistle made him shudder by its unexpectedness. Slowly he looked about. Swift as lightning he leaped from where he stood, bounding forward along the deck. You will be on Tamiser Reef, he yelled. High up on the bridge, Heemskirk looked back over his shoulder heavily. Two seamen were spinning the wheel round, and the Neptune was already swinging rapidly away from the edge of the pale water over the danger. Pa, just in time. Jasper turned about instantly to watch his brig, and, even before he realized, that in obedience, it appears, to Heemskirk's orders given beforehand to the gunner the tow rope had been let go at the blast of the whistle. Before he had time to cry out or to move a limb, he saw her cast adrift and shooting across the gunboat's stern with the impetus of her speed. He followed her fine, gliding form with eyes growing big with incredulity, wild with horror. The cries on board of her came to him only as a dreadful and confused murmur through the loud thumping of blood in his ears. While she held on, she ran upright in a terrible display of her gift of speed, with an incomparable air of life and grace. She ran on till the smooth level of water in front of her bows seemed to sink down suddenly as if sucked away, and, with a strange, violent tremor of her mastheads, she stopped, inclined her lofty spars a little, and lay still. She lay still on the reef, while the Neptune, fetching a wide circle, continued at full speed up Spermond Passage. Heading for the town, she lay still, perfectly still, with something ill-omened and unnatural in her attitude. In an instant, the subtle melancholy of things touched by decay had fallen on her in the sunshine. She was but a speck in the brilliant emptiness of space, already lonely, already desolate. Hold him, yelled a voice from the bridge. Jasper had started to run to his brig with a headlong impulse. As a man dashes forward to pull away with his hands a living, breathing, loved creature from the brink of destruction. Hold him, stick to him, vociferated the lieutenant at the top of the bridge ladder, while Jasper struggled madly without a word. Only his head emerging from the heaving crowd of the Neptune's seamen, who had flung themselves upon him obediently. Hold, I would not have that fellow drown himself for anything now. Jasper ceased struggling, 
One by one they let go of him. They fell back gradually farther and farther. In attentive silence, leaving him standing unsupported in a widened, clear space, as if to give him plenty of room to fall after the struggle. He did not even sway perceptibly. Half an hour later, when the Neptune anchored in front of the town, he had not stirred yet. Had moved neither head nor limb as much as a hair's breadth. Directly the rumble of the gunboat's cable had ceased. Heemskirk came down heavily from the bridge. Call a sampan, he said, in a gloomy tone, as he passed the sentry at the gangway, and then moved on slowly towards the spot where Jasper, the object of many odd glances, stood looking at the deck, as if lost in a brown study. Dean Skirk came up close and stared at him thoughtfully, with his fingers over his lips. Here he was, the favored vagabond, the only man to whom that infernal girl was likely to tell the story. But he would not find it funny. The story how Lieutenant Heemskirk no, he would not laugh at it. He looked as though he would never laugh at anything in his life. Suddenly Jasper looked up, his eyes, without any other expression but bewilderment, met those of Heemskirk. Observant and somber, gone on the reef, he said in a low, astounded tone. On the reef, he repeated still lower, and as if attending inwardly to the birth of some awful and amazing sensation. On the very top of high water, spring tides, Heemskirk struck in with a vindictive, exulting violence which flashed and expired. He paused as if weary, fixing upon Jasper his arrogant eyes, over which secret disenchantment, the unavoidable shadow of all passion, seemed to pass like a saddening cloud. On the very top, he repeated, rousing himself in fierce reaction, to snatch his laced cap off his head with a horizontal derisive flourish towards the gangway. And now you may go ashore to the courts, you damned Englishman, he said. Chapter V.I. The affair of the Brig Benito was bound to cause a sensation in Macassar, the prettiest and perhaps the cleanest looking of all the towns in the islands, which, however, knows few occasions for excitement. The front, with its special population, was soon aware that something had happened. A steamer towing a sailing vessel had been observed far out to sea for some time and when the steamer came in alone. Leaving the other outside, attention was aroused. Why was that? Her masts only could be seen with furled sails remaining in the same place to the southward. And soon the rumor ran all along the crowded seashore street that there was a ship on Tamiser Reef. That crowd interpreted the appearance correctly. Its cause was beyond their penetration, for who could associate a girl nine hundred miles away with the stranding of a ship on Tamiser Reef? Or look for the remote filiation of that event in the psychology of at least three people, even if one of them, Lieutenant Heemskirk, was at that very moment passing amongst them on his way to make his verbal report. No, the mines on the front were not competent for that sort of investigation, but many hands there, brown hands, yellow hands, white hands were raised to shade the eyes gazing out to sea. The rumor spread quickly. Chinese shopkeepers came to their doors, more than one white merchant, even, rose from his desk, to go to the window. After all, a ship on Tamisa was not an everyday occurrence. 
and presently the rumor took a more definite shape. An English trader detained on suspicion at sea by the Neptun Heemskir was towing him in to test a case, and by some strange accident, later on the name came out. The Benito what impossible! Yes, yes, the Benito. Look, you can see from here only two masts. It's a brig. Didn't think that man would ever let himself be caught. Team Skirk's pretty smart, too. They say she's fitted out in her cabin like a gentleman's yacht. That Alan is a sort of gentleman, too. An extravagant beggar. A young man entered smartly Messrs. Messman Brothers' office on the front, bubbling with some further information. Oh, yes, that's the Benito for certain. But you don't know the story I've heard just now. The fellow must have been feeding that river with firearms for the last year or two. Well, it seems he has grown so reckless from long impunity that he has actually dared to sell the very ship's rifles this time. It's a fact. The rifles are not on board. What impudence! Only he didn't know that there was one of our warships on the coast. But those Englishmen are so impudent that perhaps he thought that nothing would be done to him for it. Our courts do let off these fellows too often, on some miserable excuse or other. But, at any rate, there's an end of the famous Benito. I have just heard in the harbor office that she must have gone on at the very top of high water. And she is in ballast, too. No human power, they think, can move her from where she is. I only hope it is so. Would be fine to have the notorious Benito stuck up there as a warning to others. Mr. J. Messman a colonial-born Dutchman, a kind, paternal old fellow, with a clean-shaven, quiet, handsome fade, and a head of fine iron-gray hair curling a little on his collar, did not say a word in defense of Jasper and the Benito. He rose from his armchair suddenly. His face was visibly troubled. It had so happened that once, from a business talk of ways and means, island trade, money matters, and so on, Jasper had been led to open himself to him on the subject of Freya and the excellent man, who had known old Nelson years before and even remembered something of Freya, was much astonished and amused by the unfolding of the tale. Well, 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 Nelson, yes, of course. A very honest sort of man. And a little child with very fair hair. Oh, yes, I have a distinct recollection. And so she has grown into such a fine girl, so very determined, so very, and he laughed almost boisterously. Mind, when you have happily eloped with your future wife, Captain Allen, you must come along this way. And we shall welcome her here, a little fair-headed child, I remember. I remember. It was that knowledge which had brought trouble to his face at the first news of the wreck. He took up his hat. Where are you going, Mr. Messman? I am going to look for Alan. I think he must be ashore. Does anybody know? No one of those present knew, and Mr. Messman went out on the front to make inquiries. The other part of the town, the part near the church and the fort, got its information in another way. The first thing disclosed to it was Jasper himself, walking rapidly as though he were pursued. 
and, as a matter of fact, a Chinaman, obviously a Sampan man, was following him at the same headlong pace. Suddenly, while passing Orange House, Jasper swerved and went in, or, rather, rushed in, startling Gomez. The hotel clerk, very much, but a Chinaman beginning to make an unseemly noise at the door claimed the immediate attention of Gomez. His grievance was that the white man whom he had brought on shore from the gunboat had not paid him his boat fare. He had pursued him so far, asking for it all the way. But the white man had taken no notice whatever of his just claim. Gomez satisfied the coolie with a few coppers, and then went to look for Jasper, whom he knew very well. He found him standing stiffly by a little round table. At the other end of the veranda a few men sitting there had stopped talking, and were looking at him in silence. Two billiard players with cues in their hands had come to the door of the billiard room and stared, too. On Gomez coming up to him, Jasper raised one hand to point at his own throat. Gomez noted the somewhat soiled state of his white clothes, then took one look at his face and fled away to order the drink for which Jasper seemed to be asking where he wanted to go, or what purpose where he, perhaps, only imagined himself to be going, when a sudden impulse or the sight of a familiar place had made him turn into Orange House, it is impossible to say. He was steadying himself lightly with the tips of his fingers on the little table. There were on that veranda two men whom he knew well personally, but his gaze roaming incessantly as though he were looking for a way of escape. Passed and repassed over them without a sign of recognition. They, on their side, looking at him, doubted the evidence of their own eyes. It was not that his face was distorted. On the contrary, it was still, it was set. But its expression, somehow, was unrecognizable. Can that be him? They wondered with awe. In his head, there was a wild chaos of clear thoughts. Perfectly clear. It was this clearness which was so terrible in conjunction with the utter inability to lay hold of any single one of them all. He was saying to himself, or to them, Steady, steady. A China boy appeared before him with a glass on a tray. He poured the drink down his throat and rushed out. His disappearance removed the spell of wonder from the beholders. One of the men jumped up and moved quickly to that side of the veranda from which almost the whole of the roadstead could be seen. At the very moment when Jasper, issuing from the door of the orange house, was passing under him in the street below. He cried to the others excitedly, That was Alan right enough, but where is his brig? Jasper heard these words with extraordinary loudness. The heavens rang with them, as if calling him to account for those were the very words Freya would have to use. It was an annihilating question. It struck his consciousness like a thunderbolt, and brought a sudden night upon the chaos of his thoughts even as he walked. He did not check his pace. He went on in the darkness for another three strides, and then fell. The good messman had to push on as far as the hospital before he found him. The doctor there talked of a slight heat stroke, nothing very much. Out in three days, 
it must be admitted that the doctor was right. In three days, Jasper Allen came out of the hospital, and became visible to the town very visible indeed, and remained so for quite a long time. Long enough to become almost one of the sights of the place, long enough to become disregarded at last. Long enough for the tale of his haunting visibility to be remembered in the islands to this day. The talk on the front and Jasper's appearance in the Orange House stand at the beginning of the famous Benito case and give a view of its two aspects, the practical and the psychological. The case for the courts and the case for compassion, at last terribly evident and yet obscure. It has, you must understand, remained obscure even for that friend of mine who wrote me the letter mentioned in the very first lines of this narrative. He was one of those in Mr. Messman's office, and accompanied that gentleman in his search for Jasper. His letter described to me the two aspects and some of the episodes of the case. Dean Skirk's attitude was that of deep thankfulness for not having lost his own ship, and that was all. Haze over the land was his explanation of having got so close to Tamasar Reef. He saved his ship, and for the rest he did not care. As to the fat gunner, he deposed simply that he thought at the time that he was acting for the best by letting go the tow rope but admitted that he was greatly confused by the suddenness of the emergency. As a matter of fact, he had acted on very precise instructions from Heemskirk, to whom through several years' service together in the East he had become a sort of devoted henchman. What was most amazing in the detention of the Benito was his story how, proceeding to take possession of the firearms as ordered, he discovered that there were no firearms on board. All he found in the fore cabin was an empty rack for the proper number of eighteen rifles. But of the rifles themselves, never a single one anywhere in the ship. The mate of the brig, who looked rather ill and behaved excitedly, as though he were perhaps a lunatic, wanted him to believe that Captain Allen knew nothing of this, that it was he, the mate, who had recently sold these rifles in the dead of night to a certain person up the river. In proof of this story, he produced a bag of silver dollars and pressed it on his, the gunner's, acceptance. Then, suddenly flinging it down on the deck, he beat his own head with both his fists and started heaping shocking curses upon his own soul for an ungrateful wretch not fit to live. All this the gunner reported at once to his commanding officer. What he skirk intended by taking upon himself to detain the Benito it is difficult to say, except that he meant to bring some trouble into the life of the man favored by Freya. He had been looking at Jasper with a desire to strike that man of kisses and embraces to the earth. The question was how could he do it without giving himself away, but the report of the gunner created a serious case enough. Yet Alan had friends, and who could tell whether he would somehow succeed in wriggling out of it? The idea of simply towing the brig so much compromised on to the reef came to him while he was listening to the fat gunner in his cabin. There was but little risk of being disapproved now, and it should be made to appear an accident. Going out on deck he had gloated upon his unconscious victim with such a sinister roll of his eyes, such a queerly pursed mouth, that Jasper could not help smiling, and the lieutenant had gone on the bridge, saying to himself, 
You wait. I shall spoil the taste of those sweet kisses for you. When you hear of Lieutenant Heemskirk in the future, that name won't bring a smile on your lips. I swear. You are delivered into my hands. And this possibility had come about without any planning, one could almost say naturally, as if events had mysteriously shaped themselves to fit the purposes of a dark passion. The most astute scheming could not have served Heemskirk better. It was given to him to taste a transcendental, an incredible perfection of vengeance. To strike a deadly blow into that hated person's heart, and to watch him afterwards walking about with the dagger in his breast. For that is what the state of Jasper amounted to. He moved, acted, weary eyed, keen faced, lank and restless, with brusque movements and fierce gestures. He talked incessantly in a frenzied and fatigued voice, but within himself he knew that nothing would ever give him back the brig. Just as nothing can heal a pierced heart, his soul, kept quiet in the stress of love by the unflinching Freya's influence, was like a still but over wound string. The shock had started it vibrating, and the string had snapped. He had waited for two years in a perfectly intoxicated confidence for a day that now would never come to a man disarmed for life by the loss of the brig. And, it seemed to him, made unfit for love to which he had no foothold to offer. Day after day he would traverse the length of the town, follow the coast, and, reaching the point of land opposite that part of the reef, on which his brig lay stranded. Look steadily across the water at her beloved form, once the home of an exulting hope, and now in her inclined, desolated immobility, towering above the lonely sea horizon, a symbol of despair. The crew had left her in due course, in her own boats which directly they reached the town were sequestrated by the harbor authorities. The vessel, too, was sequestrated pending proceedings, but these same authorities did not take the trouble to set a guard on board. For, indeed, what could move her from there? Nothing, unless a miracle, nothing, unless Jasper's eyes, fastened on her tensely for hours together, as though he hoped by the mere power of vision to draw her to his breast. All this story, read in my friend's very chatty letter, dismayed me not a little. But it was really appalling to read his relation of how Schultz, the mate, went about everywhere affirming with desperate pertinacity that it was he alone who had sold the rifles. I stole them, he protested. Of course, no one would believe him. My friend himself did not believe him, though he, of course, admired this self-sacrifice. But a good many people thought it was going too far to make oneself out a thief for the sake of a friend. Only, it was such an obvious lie, too that it did not matter, perhaps. I, who, in view of Schultz's psychology, knew how true that must be, admit that I was appalled. So this was how a perfidious destiny took advantage of a generous impulse, and I felt as though I were an accomplice in this perfidy. Since I did to a certain extent encourage Jasper, yet I had warned him as well. The man seemed to have gone crazy on this point, wrote my friend. He went to Messman with his story. He says that some rascally white man living amongst the natives up that river made him drunk with some gin one evening. 
and then jeered at him for never having any money. Then he, protesting to us that he was an honest man and must be believed, described himself as being a thief whenever he took a drop too much, and told us that he went on board and passed the rifles one by one without the slightest compunction to a canoe which came alongside that night, receiving ten dollars apiece for them. Next day, he was ill with shame and grief, but had not the courage to confess his lapse to his benefactor. When the gunboat stopped the brig, he felt ready to die with the apprehension of the consequences, and would have died happily. If he could have been able to bring the rifles back by the sacrifice of his life, he said nothing to Jasper, hoping that the brig would be released presently. When it turned out otherwise and his captain was detained on board the gunboat, he was ready to commit suicide from despair. Only he thought it his duty to live in order to let the truth be known. I am an honest man, I am an honest man, he repeated, in a voice that brought tears to our eyes. You must believe me when I tell you that I am a thief of vile, low, cunning, sneaking thief as soon as I've had a glass or two. Take me somewhere where I may tell the truth on oath. When we had at last convinced him that his story could be of no use to Jasper for what Dutch court would accept such an explanation, and, indeed, how, when, where could one hope to find proofs of such a tale, he made as if to tear his hair in handfuls. But, calming down, said, Goodbye, then, gentlemen and went out of the room so crushed that he seemed hardly able to put one foot before the other. That very night he committed suicide by cutting his throat in the house of a half-caste with whom he had been lodging since he came ashore from the wreck. That throat, I thought with a shudder, which could produce the tender, persuasive, manly, but fascinating voice which had aroused Jasper's ready compassion, and had secured Freya's sympathy, who could ever have supposed such an end in store for the impossible. Gentle Schultz, with his idiosyncrasy of naive pilfering, so absurdly straightforward that, even in the people who had suffered from it, it aroused nothing more than a sort of amused exasperation. He was really impossible. His lot evidently should have been a half-starved, mysterious, but by no means tragic existence as a mild-eyed, inoffensive beachcomber on the fringe of native life. There are occasions when the irony of fate, which some people profess to discover in the working out of our lives, wears the aspect of crude and savage jesting. I shook my head over the manes of Schultz, and went on with my friend's letter. It told me how the brig on the reef, looted by the natives from the coast villages, acquired gradually the lamentable aspect. The grey ghastliness of a wreck, while Jasper, fading daily into a mere shadow of a man, strode brusquely all along the front with horribly lively eyes and a faint, fixed smile on his lips, to spend the day on a lonely spit of sand looking eagerly at her, as though he had expected some shape on board to rise up and make some sort of sign to him over the decaying bulwarks. The messmans were taking care of him as far as it was possible. The Benito case had been referred to Batavia, where no doubt it would fade away in a fog of official papers. It was heartrending to read all this. That active and zealous officer, Lieutenant Heemskirk, his air of sullen, 
Arkley Payne's self-importance not lightened by the approval of his action conveyed to him unofficially, had gone on to take up his station in the Moluccas. Then, at the end of the bulky, kindly meant epistle, dealing with the island news of half a year at least. My friend wrote, a couple of months ago old Nelson turned up here, arriving by the mail boat from Java. Came to see Messman, it seems. A rather mysterious visit, and extraordinarily short, after coming all that way. He stayed just four days at the Orange House, with apparently nothing in particular to do, and then caught the south-going steamer for the Straits. I remember people saying at one time that Alan was rather sweet on old Nelson's daughter, the girl that was brought up by Mrs. Harley, and then went to live with him at the Seven Isles group. Surely you remember old Nelson. Remember old Nelson, rather. The letter went on to inform me further that old Nelson, at least, remembered me since some time after his flying visit to Macassar he had written to the Messmans asking for my address in London. That old Nelson or Nielsen, the note of whose personality was a profound, echoless irresponsiveness to everything around him, should wish to write or find anything to write about to anybody, was in itself a cause for no small wonder. And to me, of all people, I waited with uneasy impatience for whatever disclosure could come from that naturally benighted intelligence. But my impatience had time to wear out before my eyes beheld old Nelson's trembling, painfully formed handwriting. Senile and childish at the same time, on an envelope bearing a penny stamp and the postal mark of the Notting Hill office. I delayed opening it in order to pay the tribute of astonishment due to the event by flinging my hands above my head. So he had come home to England to be definitely Nelson, or else was on his way home to Denmark, where he would revert forever to his original Nielsen, but old Nelson or Nielsen out of the tropics seemed unthinkable. And yet he was there, asking me to call. His address was at a boarding house in one of those Basewater squares. Once of leisure, which nowadays are reduced to earning their living. Somebody had recommended him there. I started to call on him on one of those January days in London, one of those wintry days composed of the four devilish elements. Cold, wet, mud, and grime combined with a particular stickiness of atmosphere that clings like an unclean garment to one's very soul. Yet on approaching his abode I saw, like a flicker far behind the soiled veil of the four elements, the wearisome and splendid glitter of a blue sea with the seven islets like minute specks swimming in my eye, the high red roof of the bungalow crowning the very smallest of them all. This visual reminiscence was profoundly disturbing. I knocked at the door with a faltering hand. Old Nelson or Nielsen got up from the table at which he was sitting with a shabby pocket book full of papers before him. He took off his spectacles before shaking hands. For a moment neither of us said a word. Then, noticing me looking round somewhat expectantly, he murmured some words, of which I caught only daughter and Hong Kong. Cast his eyes down and sighed. His moustache, sticking all ways out, as of yore, was quite white now. His old cheeks were softly rounded, with some color in them, strangely enough, that something childlike always noticeable in the general contour of his physiognomy, 
had become much more marked. Like his handwriting, he looked childish and senile. He showed his age most in his unintelligently furrowed, anxious forehead and in his round, innocent eyes, which appeared to me weak and blinking and watery, or was it that they were full of tears? To discover old Nelson fully informed upon any matter, whatever was a new experience, and after the first awkwardness had worn off, he talked freely with, now and then, a question to start him going whenever he lapsed into silence, which he would do suddenly, clasping his hands on his waistcoat in an attitude which would recall to me the East Veranda, where he used to sit talking quietly and puffing out his cheeks in what seemed now old, very old days. He talked in a reasonable, somewhat anxious tone. No, no. We did not know anything for weeks. Out of the way like that, we couldn't, of course. No mail service to the Seven Isles. But one day I ran over to Banka in my big sailing boat to see whether there were any letters and saw a Dutch paper, but it looked only like a bit of marine news, English brig Benito gone, ashore outside Macassar Roads. That was all. I took the paper home with me and showed it to her. I will never forgive him, she cries with her old spirit. My dear, I said, you are a sensible girl. The best man may lose a ship. But what about your health? I was beginning to be frightened at her looks. She would not let me talk even of going to Singapore before. But, really, such a sensible girl couldn't keep unobjecting forever. Do what you like, Papa, she says, rather a job, that... Had to catch a steamer at sea, but I got her over all right. There, doctors, of course, fever, anemia, put her to bed. Two or three women very kind to her. Naturally, in our papers, the whole story came out before long. She reads it to the end, lying on the couch, then hands the newspaper back to me whispers Heemskirk, and goes off into a faint. He blinked at me for quite a long time, his eyes running full of tears again. Next day, he began, without any emotion in his voice. She felt stronger, and we had a long talk. She told me everything. Here old Nelson, with his eyes cast down, gave me the whole story of the Heemskirk episode in Freya's words. Then went on in his rather jerky utterance, and looking up innocently. My dear, I said you have behaved in the main like a sensible girl. I have been horrid, she cries, and he is breaking his heart over there. Well, she was too sensible not to see she wasn't in a state to travel. But I went. She told me to go. She was being looked after very well. Anemia getting better, they said. He paused. You did see him, I murmured. Oh, yes, I did see him. He started again, talking in that reasonable voice as though he were arguing a point. I did see him. I came upon him. I sunk an inch into his head, nothing but skin on the bones of his face. A skeleton in dirty white clothes. That's what he looked like. How Freya! But she never did not really. He was sitting there, 
the only live thing for miles along that coast. On a drift log washed up on the shore, they had clipped his hair in the hospital, and it had not grown again. He stared, holding his chin in his hand, and with nothing on the sea between him and the sky but that wreck. When I came up to him, he just moved his head a bit. Is that you, old man? Says he like that. If you had seen him, you would have understood at once how impossible it was for Freya to have ever loved that man. Well, well, I don't say. She might have something. She was lonely, you know. But really to go away with him, never madness. She was too sensible. I began to reproach him gently, and by and by he turns on me. Write to you, what about? Come to her, what with? If I had been a man I would have carried her off, but she made a child. A happy child of me tell her that the day the only thing I had belonging to me in the world perished on this reef, I discovered that I had no power over her. As she come here with you, he shouts, blazing at me suddenly with his hollow eyes. I shook my head. Come with me, indeed. Anemia, aha, you see, go away, then, old man, and leave me alone here with that ghost. He says, jerking his head at the wreck of his brig, mad, it was getting dusk. I did not care to stop any longer all by myself with that man in that lonely place. I was not going to tell him of Freya's illness. Anemia, what was the good, mad, and what sort of husband would he have made? Anyhow, for a sensible girl like Freya, why, even my little property I could not have left them. The Dutch authorities would never have allowed an Englishman to settle there. It was not sold then. My man, Mamak, you know, was looking after it for me. Later on I let it go for a tenth of its value to a Dutch half-caste. But never mind. It was nothing to me then, yes, I went away from him. I caught the return mail boat. I told everything to Freya. He's mad, I said. And, my dear, the only thing he loved was his brig. Perhaps, she says to herself, looking straight away, her eyes were nearly as hollow as his, perhaps it is true. Yes, I would never allow him any power over me, old Nelson paused. I sat fascinated, and feeling a little cold in that room, with a blazing fire. So you see, he continued, she never really cared for him. Much too sensible. I took her away to Hong Kong. Change of climate, they said. Oh, these doctors, my God, winter time. There came ten days of cold mists and wind and rain. Pneumonia, but look here. We talked a lot together, days and evenings. Who else had she? She talked a lot to me, my own girl. Sometimes she would laugh a little. Look at me and laugh a little. I shuddered. He looked up vaguely, with a childish, puzzled moodiness. She would say, I did not really mean to be a bad daughter to you, Papa. And I would say, of course, my dear, you could not have meant it. She would lie quiet and then say, I wonder, and sometimes, I've been really a coward. She would tell me, you know, sick people, they say things. And so she would say, too, I've been conceited, headstrong, capricious. 
I sought my own gratification. I was selfish or afraid. But sick people, you know, they say anything. And once, after lying silent almost all day, she said, Yes. Perhaps when the day came I would not have gone. Perhaps, I don't know, she cried. Draw the curtain. Thanks for watching this video book is provided by Streambooks.